Hi, everyone. This is E. David Crawford, Editor-in-Chief of Grand Rounds in Urology. Joining me is Dr. Joe Presti, who is a regular presenter here in Grand Rounds. He's going to share with us uh, some information he has on a recent publication on the U.S. Services Preventive Task Force, the impact of the decision back in 2012. Joe is the regional lead for uh, GU Oncology, Kaiser Permanente, Northern California. Joe, thanks for uh, sharing this information. Okay, thanks David for that introduction. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to share uh, some data that we published recently uh, in May of this year in the Journal of General Internal Medicine. Uh, but in addition, I have some updated data, uh, which was not part of that publication, which will be part of this presentation. And really, we were interested in looking at how that 2012 USPSTF statement impacted prostate cancer presentation. And we looked at this uh, at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. Now, as we all know, prostate cancer screening still remains quite controversial. And in May of 2012, the USPSTF gave it a D recommendation, which really states that the harm outweighs the benefit and that no one should be getting screened. Now, fortunately, in May of 2018, the USPSTF upgraded that to uh, a grade C uh, for men uh, between the ages of 55 and 69, which essentially states that these men should undergo shared decision making, that is, understand the risks and benefits of screening uh, prior to them getting screened. But the impact of that 2012 statement on prostate cancer screening, presentation, uh, treatment and mortality is not fully understood. Now, as a background, it's important to understand that really screening occurs in the primary care's office. And primary care physicians tend to favor the USPSTF recommendations over all other organizations' recommendations. As you know, there are numerous organizations that put out guidelines and screening guidelines, such as the American Cancer Society, the NCCN, the American Neurological Association, et cetera. But primary care really follows USPSTF. And what has been reported in the literature up until now is that following that 2012 statement, that screening rates declined anywhere from 15 to 28%, and that biopsy rates declined about 22 to 38%. And this was in several studies. Uh, and then there has been a publication that looked at SEER data that suggested that cancer detection rates declined between 16 and 22 percent, and that metastatic rates were known to increase in elderly, that is men over the age of 75, but really did not see any difference in metastatic rates in younger men. But there are issues over these studies. A lot of this data is self-reported data. It relied on insurance claims data, and I think very important is the fact that how does one calculate a true rate in some of these very large studies such as SEER? I mean, what is the denominator to calculate that rate? It's really questionable. So the objective of our study was to look at screen eligible men in Kaiser Permanente Northern California. And by screen eligible, these are defined by our KP national guidelines. This includes African American men between the ages of 45 and 69 and all other men between the ages of 50 and 69. And we looked at this starting in 2010 and took it out to 2017. Now our publication really went up to 2015, but I'm gonna show you an additional two years of data in today's presentation. And what we looked at were the annual rates of PSA testing, prostate biopsy, incident prostate cancer detection, and incident metastatic disease. Now, as I alluded to, you know, to get a rate, you really have to know your number of events, and that's put over the denominator, which is the number of eligible men. And I think that's where we are quite unique at Kaiser Permanente, where we can calculate a true denominator and therefore give accurate rates. Now, as I said, our study spanned from 2010 to 2017. And if you recall, the, the, the USPSTF statement first came out in a draft version in October of 2011. It was finalized and published in May of 2012. But what we decided to do was look at sort of what we would refer to as a pre-guideline period, which is the years 2010 and 2011, 
and then the post guideline period, the 2014 to 2017. We really, I'll show you the data in 2012 and 2013, but we kind of look at that as a transition time because it takes a while once something gets published to really have it roll out and have it uh, effectively uh, implemented into clinical practice. So really what we'll look at here are rates of 2010, 2011 versus 2014 through 17. Now our exposure then was the USPSTF statement. And it's important to understand that Kaiser Permanente actually has some national prostate cancer screening guidelines, and they really did not significantly change over this entire study period. And the national guidelines uh, essentially are what I would refer to as a grade C um, uh, guideline, meaning it is shared decision making. That is, discuss the pros and cons of screening and see whether or not patients want to undergo it. Now here's our age distribution both before and after the guideline and for the next few graphs the red bars are the 2010 and 2011 years that's the pre-guideline and then we have the post guideline 2013 to 2017 but you can see our age distribution really did not change significantly before or after the guideline now here is our race and ethnicity breakdown and again um, Kaiser Permanente in Northern California has a tremendous racial diversity. About 60% of our population is Caucasian in this study, about 10% African American, about 15% Asian and Pacific Islander. And then what we see listed as unknown and other, really, those are often uh, multiracial uh, or biracial uh, people. And then the Hispanic population before uh, the statement was about 12% and it went to 14% after. Again, I just want to show that the mix really did not significantly change either before or after the guideline. Okay, now we're going to go through uh, four graphs here that are going to look at these various outcomes. And let me just take a minute just to describe the way I'm presenting the graphs. As you can see on the y-axis is the year, on the x-axis is the rate, the line going across the top here, these are the number of eligible population. So that essentially is the denominator for these rate calculations. And just to put it in perspective, these are not small numbers. As you can see in 2010, there were 400 and 400, I'm sorry, 404 hundred thousand screen eligible men. Our population grew over the study period to 524,000 men in 2017. The take home message from this slide, as you, can, as you can see, if we put in when that statement came out, we saw our screening rates prior to the statement was roughly 41 or 42%. And that steadily declined over time to about 30%. So we saw a significant decline in our screening rate now we're looking at our biopsy rates. Now again, remember the denominator stays the same. Okay, so it's still over 400 and 400,000 men here in 2010. And of those 400 and 400,000 men of the screen eligible population, about 1.2% of them underwent biopsy in 2010. And that rate declined to about 0.4% following the statement. So a dramatic decline in the men undergoing biopsy. We also saw a grade migration during this time period. Now this graph looks at the Gleason score on the biopsy. Uh, again, and now we're looking uh, from 2010 to 2017. In green is Gleason 6 and then other colors above. And what you can see is a marked increase in high grade disease showing up on biopsy following our statement. And that really was essentially an 84% increase in Gleason 7 or higher. And if we looked at Gleason 8 or higher, there was a 179% increase in Gleason 8, 9, and 10 following the USPSTF statement. With respect to incident prostate cancer detection, now we see again very similar trends here because before the biopsy, uh, sorry, before the statement, there were roughly 2,000 men 
being diagnosed with prostate cancer each year at Kaiser Permanente, and then this declined following the statement. And for the obvious reason, if you screen fewer, you'll have fewer men with elevated PSAs. And if you have fewer elevated PSAs, you will do fewer biopsies. And if you do fewer biopsies, you're gonna find fewer cancers. Now, I acknowledge some of this is good, meaning some of this uh, uh, loss in cancer detection was probably some indolent disease that we now put on active surveillance, uh, but we did not quantify indolent prostate cancer in this study. But here's the concerning message. And this is we saw an increase in metastatic rates. Now granted, small numbers of cases, but nonetheless truly significant. And what you could see is prior to the statement, there were somewhere around 57 to 69 metastatic cancers <clears throat> being diagnosed each year. This increased to 120 to 140 metastatic cancers uh, following the statement. So a steady, <clears throat> excuse me, steady increase in metastatic uh, disease as well. And it parallels that grade migration that we saw also on biopsy. So, you know, all studies have strengths and limitations. I think one of our strengths is that we could define an eligible population. Therefore, we could define a true denominator and therefore get accurate rates. We have a very large racially and ethnically diverse population, a very large sample size. Some of the downfalls though, we couldn't um, uh, reliably identify a positive family history for the disease. Um, and likewise, uh, we did not uh, identify indolent cancers in this study. But to conclude then, in men under the age of 70, following that 2012 statement, we saw screening rates decline about 20%. We saw biopsy rates decline 61%. We saw overall prostate cancer detection rates decline 48%. Again, I acknowledge some of that is good. Some of that might have been indolent disease that was not being picked up. However, this is the big concern. We saw a 52% increase in metastatic disease. And as I said, we also saw that grade migration which again is going to probably require many more years of follow-up to see how does that impact upon the impact, uh, the effectiveness of our treatment. Uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to allow, uh, offer this data to you. Uh, be happy to answer any questions.